So, my name is Igor. I'm working for Mobile in the last almost two years. I joined Mobile for building specifically the real-time infrastructure. And a few months ago, I got a really interesting project, which is around deep learning recommender. The project started as a master thesis by Marcel Kurovsky and was leading by uh, Florian William, a PhD f uh, employee from one of my team colleagues. And uh, they built something really interesting, but it was part of his master thesis. And they came to me and asked me, okay, how can we make it to production? And then we started a really interesting journey with a lot of challenges, which I want to discuss with you and to share today, how we actually were able eventually to bring this master thesis into production. So today, a bit for the agenda, I will start a bit with motivation about the recommender, why we need it in Mobile specifically, some of the components and the deep learning approach and architecture that we were using. So, a little bit numbers for motivation. Mobile is Germany's largest online vehicle marketplace. We have almost around 2 million different ads, and it keeps changing each day, updated constantly. We have around 43,000 dealers, which is covers almost all the dealers in Germany, so we are really the leading platform for that. We have almost around 13 and a half, 14 million unique visitors, unique vis visitors, yeah, users that come in each day, and we have a lot, a lot of changes to the items. On the other hand, we have also a lot of interactions of the users. We have almost around 100 million events that users generate each day by interactions with the platform. Events such as item views, such as searches, uh, saving to favorite lists. Okay, but when you look on that, so 100 million events, for us, it's quite a lot. But separately, each of those events do not tell us anything. And we had to come up with a way that we can reduce those 100 million events to something more useful, something more meaningful that can help us to somehow help the users to find a better car, something that fit for their preferences. So eventually the idea was to create something in the form of user preferences. So each day we take all of those 100 million events, we crunch them, we calculate them, and we reduce them eventually to around 2 million user preferences. So as you can imagine, on one hand we have 2 million items, and on the other hand, we have millions of different user preferences. So then the question and the real challenge is eventually, how can we bring it together? How can we use the part of the user preferences and the part of the items to match between them and to help find the users sort of the perfect car? So if you look, for example, on this firefighter, the perfect car that will be for him, this is the firefighter truck, right? So this is what we want to do for all of the users, to find, help them finding their perfect car. Fi Perfect match. So we tried different approaches, and one of the approaches that we tried was using deep learning. And you may ask yourself, okay, but why deep learning? There are many different ways of recommender. And we tried other recommenders as well. But deep learning, if you think about it, it can first of all capture nonlinear relationship, which is really important because most of the algorithms today for recommendations, whether it's matrix factorization or any other type of recommenders, usually have some limits about linear relationships. Second of all, it until some degree reducing engineering effort, feature engineering effort, because deep learning in the way how it build it, it can just take and combine different features together and you're getting something. Yeah, the only problem is that it's hard then to understand exactly what is the output, why we're getting some specific results, but in general it should improve also predictive capability. So this was the motivation for us to try deep learning approach. So speaking a bit about the components, what kind of components we have that are part of that major deep learning recommender? First of all, our items. So as I mentioned, we have two million items and each item have more than 100 attributes. And just to make clear, item for us, it's some sort of car. It can be a car, a motorcycle, it could be a truck, okay? So each item have more than 100 different attributes, such as price, color, a number of doors, number of previous owners, conditions, seats, and many, many. We're currently using only 20 attributes, and so we're examining the model only with 20 attributes, but definitely in the future we will try to see how we can take more of those attributes and leverage them. And our items are updated constantly by the dealers. Most of the time it's the price, but still, it's really dynamic. It's not like uh, items, for example, in Airbnb or books or Spotify that they have some, something that is more static, that once user upload a song, most of the time nothing will be changed for that song anymore. 
The other component that I mentioned is the user preferences. And in our case, the user preferences is actually modeled through the Bayesian statistics. So actually, we take all the interactions of the user, such as, for example, save to favorite list, uh, contact specific dealer, view, search, and so on. And we try to build the statistics about that user. We try to see what his preferences towards specific item attributes. For example, you can see that user X prefers 30% blue cars and 40% uh, red cars. And that user prefers 50% BMW and 40% Audi, and so on and so on. And the price distribution is around 20,000 plus minus 1.5K. So we try to build that kind of statistical model. And in addition, we calculate also the average user the preferences of the average user, and eventually using the Bayesian statistics, we weighting the specific user preferences against the average user preferences. Okay, but how does that really help us then to build our recommender? So imagine if we would have a way that we can represent our user preferences and our item in some abstraction, some sort of maybe mathematical abstraction way, and then we can take the abstraction representation of the user preferences and abstraction of the item, put them in some sort of black box, and the black box will be smart enough to give us a ranking. And that ranking will be sort of probability of user to interact with a specific item. So based on that probabilities, we can select the items, the next items that we want to show to that user. And that black box is actually, as some of you already guessed, this is a deep learning approach. So how actually is that the black box looks inside? So we have a deep learning model which is trained with, sub, with three sub different networks. Usernet, itemnet, and ranknet. The usernet is actually responsible to taking those user preferences and converting them to some sort of embedding. In another words, the embedding is a vector of 77 floats that mathematically represent that user. The itemnet, on the other hand, taking the attributes of the car and calculates also embeddings, which is also a float, a vector of 77 floats. Actually, in the training process, what we try to do is to bring the item embeddings of the, the item embeddings and the user embeddings vectors to be on the same space, because that will allow us later to do a direct comparison, for example, using equilibrium distance. Once we have the item embeddings and the user embeddings, we can pass them together through the rank net. And what the rank net do is actually is it gives a score between 0 and 1. And we're using in the rank net also negative sampling method. So actually what the rank net gives us is a probability of the user to interact with a specific item. For a higher level view, imagine that we have the user preferences, we have multiple different items, we convert them, we take the user embedding, we take multiple item embeddings, we pass it everything through the rank net, we, give, we get scores, and then based on the scores, we can decide which item we're going to present to the user. All right, so our first challenge started with our data scientist. Our data scientists are really smart guys, but as most of our data scientists, Many other data scientists today, they prefer to work with, uh, sorry, with Python, and <laughs> I wish Scala, uh, with Python, and most of the proof of concepts that they build are with Python. And they were using TensorFlow to train our deep learning models, and obviously they done it with Python. So when they came to me and they told me, okay, we need to bring it to production, we had a bit of a problem, because our production system is only Java or Scala. This is the policy currently, it's not like we have any, we not that we have anything against Python, I actually think that we should try to bring some Python stuff to production, but most of our experience of the developers and of the DevOps are around Java, and this is why we didn't want to have any sort of surprises now with Python. So we had to think how actually we can take the Python stuff, put it in Scala, because at least my team works mostly with Scala, without rewriting the code from scratch. And this is a really important requirement. After doing some search and research, I found out different blocks that most of them actually were more in the Python, but I had enough ideas and understanding how we can convert it to the Scala world. So the interesting thing that TensorFlow comes with, it's TensorFlow Serving, which is a specific C++ implementation that allows us to load TensorFlow models, TensorFlow models which can be exported and saved via protocol buffers, and Tensor Serving is the C++ implementation that can simply load the model and you can use it to serve uh, predictions or do anything that you want around these TensorFlow models. The only problem with the TensorFlow model was 
sorry, with the TensorFlow serving was that because it's C++ and because it's Google, and Google always special, they're using only the protocol which is called gRPC. gRPC communicate only via protocol buffer, which means that you cannot, ex you cannot call TensorFlow serving with a, simple REST comma, with a simple REST service or with a simple JSON interface. Okay, but all our ecosystem around the services is the rest, obviously. So we had to think how we overcome it. So the idea was to take a Docker container, which allows us to isolate resources, and to deploy in the same Docker container the TensorFlow serving and side by side a Scala application, right? The Scala application would be able locally inside the Docker to communicate with the TensorFlow serving, and other services that need to get prediction will call actually the Scala gateway. And in such a way, we were able to scale it quite well, quite well as well, because we didn't have to deploy separately any sort of TensorFlow serving cluster. The applications that we scaled was each application have a Docker and inside the Scala together with TensorFlow serving. Once we figure out how to make Scala and TensorFlow work together, we could build, we could start thinking about the different flows, how we can divide our problem to multiple parts, so we can. So we can put everything together in production. So the first workflow, so before the first workflow, actually the general concept would be as following. We have a TensorFlow module that we train in Python. Once we're finishing to train it in Python, we can export the, the model to protocol buffers file, which is really a simple file. Once we have the protocol buffer in some place that assumes some sort of object storage, okay, it doesn't important Git repository, we can actually then build a Docker image. And once we build this Docker image, the Docker image will include inside the Scala gateway that we built. The, that Scala gateway is able to communicate locally via gRPC protocol with TensorFlow serving, and we will be able also to load the protocol buffers uh, model to that Docker. And what's nice with the TensorFlow serving is that it's actually have a place, a library, sorry, a directory where it listens for new incoming protocol buffer files. So if you have a new version of the model, you can just push it to that specific folder and TensorFlow serving automatically will catch up and start serve it. So it's actually allow you, first of all, easily push new models updates without downtimes, and it allows you actually, if you will call to the tensor serving with a specific model version, to test it in AB really easily different model versions. Okay, so for the next part, we had the challenge of our items. As I mentioned, our items are constantly keep updated. The dealers constantly update the items. Sometimes they change small attributes. Most of the time they change the price. But we need to catch up prop constantly. We need to be able to calculate those item embeddings based on the attributes of the item constantly in real time. We cannot allow to ourselves do it in batch. Again, as I mentioned, because we are not like Airbnb, for example, or Spotify, where somebody upload the apartment, or somebody upload a song or a book, and this is quite statically, it will not change. Once the dealer constantly keep updates or deleting, for example, or uploading new ads, we need to be able to catch it because otherwise, if we will do a calculation of the embeddings once a day, it could be that we will serve something that's already deleted and not up to date. Also, our dealers are able to sell to sell cars quite fast, so it could be a situation that we have a new car, we didn't catch it up, we will calculate the embeddings only for the next day, but that car already gone. So we want to be able to catch up as fast as we can. So the idea was that we have a Kafka topic that includes all our items, and we constantly consuming that Kafka topic, and using the configuration of the Docker that we have uh, the Scala gateway with the tensor serving, we can actually constantly keep generating item embeddings, and we push them to a new Kafka topic. By pushing those item embeddings plus some specific item attributes to a new Kafka topic, we can also allow other teams later to leverage it and to use it for any use case that they want. We can then later to persist those embeddings to Elasticsearch, to Redis, or whatever, and I will actually touch that point. The third challenge, which was one of the biggest actually, is how we can actually generate the recommendations themselves. So having the process of being able to calculate items embeddings in real time, it's cool. And after that, we figure out how we can combine Scala and uh, gRPC and the tensor serving in the same Docker container. It was also cool, but the major uh, challenge remained actually, how can we eventually generate those kind of recommendations? So, Ideally, in a perfect world scenario, we have only 2 million, but imagine if you had 5 million. So ideally, each time we're getting a user input, we're getting from some user 
preferences service, we can get also the preferences of that user. And then in real time, we need to be able to calculate the user embedding. So imagine we could do it without a problem. But then we need actually to rank that user embeddings against all our item embeddings, against all the 2 million item embeddings to get the rank for each item and then to take, for example, the top 10 or the top 20. So actually for each user request ranking through the rank net 2 million item embeddings, it's, it will not scale, it will not work. It will take us more than a minute or two minutes to submit uh, recommendations for the user and I guess nobody will be really much happy with such performance. So the idea is that we need first to filter those items and we need first to try to find out some way that will allow us to select the more relevant items for that user. For example, let's filter out and select approximately only 200 until 300 item candidates. And based on those candidates, we will use only the embeddings of those candidates to pass them through, through the rank network and rank only those 200 until 300 candidates. Once we have done that, we can take the top 10 or the top 20 from that. But here is a problem actually, how actually we can do that kind of filtering, especially with 2 million. So our first approach was to try with Elasticsearch. So as I mentioned, we have the Kafka topic, right? And we can use the Kafka topic in order to write some sort of Elasticsearch indexer. And we would index our item embeddings to Elasticsearch together with some of the attributes. So for example, we will in index to Elasticsearch uh, the car price and the color and number of previous owners and so on. But in addition, we will index also the item embeddings. And to index the item embeddings in Elasticsearch, it's actually quite straightforward. It's just a vector, a list of uh, 77 floats in our case. Then each time when we get a request from a user, we need to calculate the user, we need to get the user preferences. We will need also to have somewhere the user embedding. And we will execute based on the user preferences, a simple query against Elasticsearch, which will do filtering based on those preferences. So for example, if we have a user that prefer red or yellow, we will ask Elasticsearch to filter all the items that have red or yellow. And we will, we will ask Elasticsearch to filter items in a specific price range, okay, in a specific uh, car model, for example, BMW or Audi. Once we will do that, we will take the top 100, the, sorry, the top 200 of the, res of the result from Elasticsearch. We take only the item embeddings of those top 200 and we pass them through Docker container, which have inside the ability to run it through the rank network. So some of the problems with that approach, first of all, our item embeddings and our user preferences already contain implicitly inside all this information about the user preferences, about the color, about the price and so on. It's just that the deep network learned it in a more abstractive way, in a more mathematical representation. So actually, if we will do that kind of filtering before, it's until some degree, I will not say it's redundant, but then uh, it's, it's useless then to use uh, deep learning because the, the real power of making better recommendations is actually to use the embeddings directly. And if I do this kind of filtering, it could be that I'm actually missing something and I will remain with items that are really not the ones that fit for that user. So this is why it was a bit problematic. Second of all, and the biggest problem, scalability. So that approach is not scaling really well. Executing thousands of those queries per second against Elasticsearch to be able to do this kind of filtering and then taking only the 200 make Elasticsearch works really hard and we saw a lot of issues. And okay, currently we have our Elasticsearch, I think is around 25 nodes cluster, but st still we had a lot of issues to scale it like beyond already 200 requests per second. So this was not the ideal solution for us. Then we decided to try a more crazy idea. And I think eventually it's actually also remained only in the matter of, uh, of idea. So the idea is as following. I will try to explain it clearly. So we have all the item embeddings. Item embeddings are just vectors, right? So the operations that we can do on top of those item embeddings is clustering using even the simple k-means. So we can cluster all the 2 million item embeddings to different clusters. Let's assume we will cluster it to 20 until 30 clusters. Once we have the clusters, we can assign each item to which cluster it belongs based on the distance calculation between the item embedding and the centroid of the cluster. 
So then what we can do in the next step, when we index our items into Elasticsearch, we can also index together with the item embedding, the item attributes, the centroid, the cluster to which that item belongs, and why it's good, how it can help us. So on the next step, when we're getting a request from a user to generate recommendations for, we can generate the user embedding. And then for that user embedding, we will do almost something similar. We will calculate a collision distance between the user embedding vector and all the centroids of the clusters that we calculated before. And then we will take, for example, two or three clusters which are the most closest to that user. Okay, so once we have the user embedding, we can calculate what are the cluster centroids that represent item embeddings closest to that user embedding, and we can use it as a filter in Elasticsearch. So then in Elasticsearch, instead of filtering by user preferences, we actually will say, okay, give us all the items that belong to cluster one, two, and five, because we believe that this is the clusters that have the items most closest to that user. Okay, but that's not enough. We want still to leverage our embeddings even more. So we could also, on those pre-filtered results, to use a Qualidian distance to calculate the distance between user embedding and item embedding. Now, it's not really a Qualidian distance, it's more approximation of a Qualidian distance because then you don't need to calculate the root square and then it's make life easier for Elasticsearch. Also because we don't really need the precise distance for the Qualidian one, we just need something that gives us relative sorting, and the approximation of equilibrium distance is good enough to give relative sorting. In order to implement the equilibrium distance calculation in Elasticsearch, it was not so straightforward, because Elasticsearch out of the box support all kinds of those functions only with vectors for two dimensions, like geo, geo queries, but not with 77 floats. So luckily for us, from Elasticsearch 5 and above, there is a new scripting language called Painless, and that language is eventually when you write a script, it's compiled directly to Java bytes, so actually the execution is as fast as it can be for native uh, Elasticsearch uh, functions already. So we actually had to write a really simple function, which was just really a simple loop that you loop through each item in each of the vectors and just do some subtraction and sum eventually. Uh, another way to do it is with uh, plugins, and we actually thought about maybe leveraging some of the Java more linear algebraic or computational numerical libraries. I tried it, I done a benchmark, but for this kind of vector subtraction of 77 floats, actually loop in Java is, was the fastest, really. So going for numerical libraries was overkill. So once we have that, we could execute sort of a rescore query inside Elasticsearch with calculating equilibrium distance and then taking uh, only the items which have the closest one, for example, the top 200. But again, we tried to do it a bit. We saw that this also have a lot of problems. You need to reduce the number of items quite drastically because uh, the calculation of the equilibrium distance, since it's not supported natively by uh, Elasticsearch was quite problematic and it was not scaling as well. So finally, the approach that we came up was the nearest neighbor's search approach, approximation actually. And we found a really good library, Annoy, which is coming from Spotify, and Spotify using this library for some of their recommendations. And the full name is Approximate Nearest Neighbors OEA. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, the name is funny, but the library is really good. And what is, was really actually good in that library is that it it is a C++ implementation, and it allows searching points in the spaces that are close to a given query, right? So for example, we have the user embedding, 77 floats. All our items are also 77 floats. So the user embeddings will be the input query for our nearest neighbor's search, and then it, it will help us to find the most closest item embeddings, which we can then later take and pass through the rank network. Well, it was extra fa really fast. The library works really fast. Uh, it keeps an index uh, mem it keeps an index file in memory. So actually, it have a special technique that I will not go too deep into it, which use random projections and it create a special index tree. And inside index tree, this is they use some sort of approximation to find the nearest uh, neighbors. What was the best? that it supports Scala and Python. As I mentioned, we didn't want to rewrite the code, so we want to have something that the data science can check on his side from Python perspective, and we can check in Scala, and that it will have exactly the same behavior. And the fact that the memory, that the index file is in memory, it's also helped a lot to boost up the performance, especially since, at least in our case, we have only two million, so putting it in memory, it was like around 1.5 gigabyte, which is definitely not a problem today in any environment, in any production environment. 
Uh, Anoi library supports multiple different distance calculation like Equilidian, Manhattan, and Hamming, and so on. We had to we needed only the Equilidian, and it works best with vectors under 100 dimensions. But actually, it performs quite well also with vectors up until 1,000 dimensions. Since we have 77 dimensions, it was perfect for us. So how we make it work eventually? So back to the flow that we had about how we update in real time our item embeddings. Right, so we have still the Kafka topic with item embeddings, and we have the Docker configuration with Scala Gateway and TensorFlow serving. We calculate the item embeddings, but eventually, since we're putting them, as remember I told you, since we put them in a separate Kafka topic, somebody else can just take that topic, consume it, and to do whatever you want. So in the first attempt, we tried to consume from that topic and putting indexing in Elasticsearch. On the second attempt, what we're doing is actually we're running a scheduled job in Jenkins each hour, and that job each hour consume all the items from that Kafka topic. And again, since we have only 2 million, we can afford it, and it takes around 15 minutes to consume the entire topic, and it builds that kind of annoy index file. Once we are finishing to build that annoy index file, we need to push it to some object storage, which will be used later by some the core application to load it into memory and to use for submitting the recommendations. Anything I missed? No. Okay. So then the next question, after we solved how we select candidates using the nearest approximate neighbors approach, and how and how we were able to calculate item embeddings and update them in real time, and that we figure out how we're dealing with the problem of Python and Scala. The next question is actually, okay, but how do you eventually generate those recommendations? And again, we need to be able to generate recommendations in real time. We don't want to generate those recommendations in a batch once a day. So each time a user gets a request, we want to calculate his embeddings, and we want to calculate what items can fit him for the for that point, the most updated items, not waiting for the night to do that kind of magic. So we have another Docker container, which is the main, the core application, the core deep learning application. And that Docker container has three major components. So it will have the Scala gateway that have all the logic and all the coordination between all the different pieces and networks. It have tensor serving, tensor serving again, the same configuration, but this time we have two different nets that we are holding in that Docker. We have the user net in order to be able to calculate user embeddings in real time, and we have the rank net in order to make the ranking between the user net and the item embeddings. And actually, we also need the annoy index file, so the Scala application can look inside that annoy index to find the nearest neighbors, the candidates. So, Let's have a look on the flow, what's happening when we're getting a request of a user and we need to generate recommendations. So first of all, we need to get the user preferences. And the user preferences we can get from the user preferences service. It's a completely separate service. And actually, I gave a talk about it uh, last, uh, last year. I also recommend you if you want to see how you can calculate user preferences in real time. The tricky thing with the user preferences is like item embeddings. User preferences are calculated in real time. So when some user comes to our platform, he search, he view, he, he save something to his favorite lead, list, his preferences updated almost immediately, which means that, the prof, the, that the pre, those preferences are not static, they are dynamic. And that means that we really cannot calculate user embeddings overnight as well, because it keeps changing constantly. This is why we need to take the, the raw user preferences, those statistics of 20 prof, 20% blue color and price distribution of 20,000 plus minus 1.5K, and from those in real time to be able to calculate the user embedding. So once we're getting the user preferences, the next step will be to calculate the user embedding using the user net. Once we have the user embedding, we continue to the following step, which is finding the K nearest items using the annoy library, right? The annoy index files, the nearest neighbors approach we take. We take approximately, now I think today, 200 candidates. Once we have those 200 candidates, which are, we believe, the most closest to that user, we're using the other net, rank net, to give a score for each of those item embeddings and sort of saying, this is the probability of that user to interact with that items. And finally, from those, we take top 10 or top 20, it depends on the stakeholder. In the service, you can define, I want 10 recommendations, five recommendations. So this would be eventually our recommendations. Okay, so 
the general view, how everything looks eventually in production. So we have one side that is consuming items, calculated constantly the item embeddings, putting them to Kafka topic, which have those embeddings. We have a, a job that runs each hour, calculate, generates a new Anoy index file, and push it to some object storage. Something like S3, but we have our own private cloud, so it's something based on OpenStack. On the other hand, we have another Docker, which is the core deep learning application. It is able to communicate with the user preferences service to get the preferences each time it's needed. It's able to calculate the user embeddings in real time each time it's needed, and to do the ranking. And also, he needs to load the Anoy index file from that object storage. So when we deploy the application on the production at the beginning, there is a sort of part of the code that knows, okay, now before I start the application and it's available for all the stakeholders, I need first to go and grab the Anoy index from the object storage. The other question is, how actually, but then you put each hour the new updated Anoy index file to that application? And here there are multiple ways. One of the ways is, for example, to build a mechanism inside your application that constantly keep checking each minute, for example, the object storage to see if there is a new file, and if yes, it's loaded, and it's doing swap in memory on the fly. So really, without any kind of downtimes. This is one way. Another option is to send actually notifications to the application saying, hey, I have a calculated new file, please grab it from the, please, please get it from the object storage. And this you can do in two ways. Either you have a Kafka topic, which the application consumes messages from Kafka topic, and through the Kafka topic you keep sending messages, hey, I have a new file, and then the application will know to grab it. Either, actually, what we decided to do, it's a bit more easier, we have something called console from HashiCorp. It's a, it's a specific software that allow uh, self-discovery of services, but it have also a lightweight key value storage, and it actually have a specific functionality that you can listen to changes in that specific key value. So each time we actually push a new index file to the object storage, we update that key value. The other application constantly listening to changes in that key value, and once there is a change, it will take the new URL and will download the new index file and keep it in and switch switch it in memory. All right, so for some final notes. Bring data scientists down to earth. Really important, because when I came to start working with the data scientists about this project, they had the Python and they had this implementation and there was some exotic library here and exotic libraries there and many requirements. And I told them, look guys, this is all nice. It works fine, it works really beautiful in your thesis, but we need to bring it to production. Production is a completely different environment. We cannot allow ourselves too much playing there and failing, so you need to see what data science brings you, and then you need to comfort him with what is actually possible in reality. Okay, but don't, stop from, but don't stop from yourself to being creative. Don't say, hey, this is really hard to implement, I don't know, this is exotic, I don't know how to put it in the Scala world, so we'll not put it. No. Try to listen and try to, to see what you can do. This is why it's ti you need to take time to do the research and read. It took me some time to read different blogs and researchers, especially even not related to Scala, and, but more to Python, to get to get idea how we can actually do it in Scala as well. For that project, actually, I think that basic understanding of deep learning concept was enough. I am really not a deep learning expert. As you see, this talk was not about how to choose a proper deep learning model or framework or whatever, but how you can put the pieces working together in production. And basic concepts understanding is quite important. Really important, at least for our case, was to find Scala equivalent libraries to Python because we didn't want to do code rewrite since we have already that kind of experience from previous projects. So for me, it's really important. Otherwise, you have a really hell maintaining two different code bases. And as I mentioned, creavi creativity and out-of-the-box thinking, it's quite important. Don't give up because you think something is too new or too exotic. Maybe there are still some really nice solutions somewhere that you can leverage. Thank you. So we have five minutes question, so. Um, hi. Um, you mentioned that you're running an hourly job to uh, recalculate the index for the now library, right? Does it uh, mean that you are still running into the risk of having uh, like outdated index, basically? Yes, but uh, we did some uh, analytics and uh, we tried to see what are the 
risk for that. And we saw that there are constantly items that are updated, but still we decided that during that hour we can sort of take that risk. Because otherwise it was between not doing it at all or doing it sort of, you can say, just in time, right? So real-time definitions are what is real-time for you is just in time. I'm, uh, I'm, curi I'm curious if you looked at the Elasticsearch Learning to Rank plugin for implementing RankNet, because they have a RankNet implementation. So again, the There's a Elasticsearch Learning to Rank yeah, plugin. Yeah, we, we had a look on that, but this is actually not the one. Uh, this, it works a bit differently than that one. It will not help us. A actually, I didn't have time to put it on the slides here, but we had a recently workshop uh, with uh, Vespa. I don't know if you heard about it. It's uh, open source recently from Yahoo. And actually, we are now evaluating it to see if this can replace entirely that uh, stuff because it's exactly for that use case. Uh, when we evaluate, evaluated um, the Scala and the Python uh, implementation of Anoi, we found that the uh, Scala implementation was very slow. Uh, did you have any, did you look into the performance of this? Maybe we used the wrong library. So you mean Scala implementation of TensorFlow? Uh, Anoi. Ah, of Hanoi. I'm using the Scala implementation of Hanoi. And did you do any evaluation of the, the performance versus the Python implementation? Uh, we, I, I don't remember if we've done any comparison, but it was working, I mean, fine, and we compared with data science to see that we're getting the same results, and uh, there is actually two implementations. Yeah. And uh, one is a Scala pure implementation, and one is a binding to C++ that using the Hanoi itself. Mm. So it depends which one you take. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'd be interested to know how you measure the improvement of your recommendation system after you implemented this in production. Good question. Unfortunately, currently I cannot answer it because this is still going to the A-B test scenario. And uh, most of the evaluation was done actually in sort of offline manner. This is why we really try to bring it now properly to production with proper... So it's in production. It's just waiting for A-B test to run properly so we can know the results. So it's quite fresh out of the oven. So, but the answer would be A-B testing in that case. So currently we try to A-B test against the current recommender, but in general the idea is to build a system that keeps constantly monitoring the performance of that. So then it also can trigger the training of a new model when it's needed. Hi, um, one question. So TensorFlow Serving is now out for in version one since 2017 something. So what's your if you look back, having it in production for real UK with a lot of data, um, how is it working? How are the monitoring capabilities? How stable is it? So um, the part of the item embeddings, which we calculate from Kafka constantly, it's in production, I think, already for three or four months. The other part took us a bit more time to bring to production. I didn't see any problems. I keep monitoring the performance like quite good Some, uh, from two until three milliseconds uh, for making a prediction. On the 95 percentage, uh, the problem that uh, I do know with tensor serving is that uh, you can submit sort of, for example, 200 items to be ranked at the same time. This will be fine, but if you will try to submit thousands of them, then tensor serving start to be a problem. And this is, for example, why Vespa decided to sort of rewrite their own tensor serving. All right. Thanks. So, um, question about uh, RankNet. So, the two inputs is one, the embedding of the item and uh, imbe embedding of the user. So, uh, and then rank, RankNet is kind of black box which could learn any function. But further, you use as assumption that the Euclidean distance is like a good uh, thing to filter for. So, how, uh, the question is how do you uh, make sure that this assumption is, uh, is true? OK, I will try to answer it because, as I mentioned, I am not coming more from the data science part. But first of all, the rank net is more using a sync uh, function similar to logistic regression, some sigmoid to do the classification with some negative uh, sampling. This is one thing. Second thing, we, we try to punish the training of the model between the item embeddings and the user embeddings. I think is using cos in distant. So you try to do some sort of punishment over there in order to force the item embeddings and the user embeddings to be in the same space. So this is why we believe that the equilibrium distance can be a good enough approximation to find uh, close items. We also tried different methods to do the evaluation, and we saw actually that equilinear distance works quite well with combination with the rank network. But yeah, 
user preferences are dynamically changing, the, so they're quite stochastic. The item embedding are quite static, so it's, it's based on the same attributes, right, of the car, but from one point, we try to bring them to the same space. From another point, a car born to be red, but user have some preferences, which is not always red. So, but still, the, the performance was uh, quite well. Okay. Thanks. So last question, yeah. I was curious if there was an advantage to, to rank net versus a gradient boosting method, if you looked at that. So I didn't what, really much understand the second one. This is probably because I don't know it. I can ask one of the data scientists and uh, tell you. <laughs> I am purely in data engineering. So no more question? Last one. Uh, how do you know that you profile the same users? You don't have to log in into your uh, site to perform the search. And uh, since users don't have to uh, authenticate, uh, how do you distinguish different users from each other? It's a kind of a basic question, but I, I'm curious how you do it. Well, I think it's a G GDPR related question. Not sure I can answer you as a lawyer. <laughs> but uh, we just use the cookie ID, and uh, for those that are logged in, it's uh, cool, but most of our users actually not log in. Uh, so it's just the best effort that we can do. It could be a situation that you are coming at mobile, and tomorrow you'll be uh, on the desktop and you, we will see you as two different users. So we try to do the best as we can in the, you know, in the limits of the law. Okay, so thank you, and uh, you can enjoy your lunch next door.